Yeah. Uh, Charles, would you share the story about reconnecting with your wife? Oh. You she's bad for us, so she's not going to stand. Uh -huh. She's bad for us, you know. Well, I had just a both little richer sister. I was married to Sister Peggy Pennon for 10 years. And I say, I'm a free man now. Free at last. Free at last. And what happened was, excuse me, and uh, what happened was, I signed an autograph for a little girl in the Philippines when she was six, you know, six seven years old. And I signed an autograph for her. And uh, I said, keep rock and roll in your life. I hope you come to America someday. He said, okay. Okay, I'm still going back to uh, the United States. So I seen this beautiful girl up at Pioneer Supermarket. Uh, and I say, what is your name? And she, she didn't answer, you, you know, I mean, so I'm a musician. You hurt my ego. You know who I am? <laughs> That's a joke, but yeah, you know. But I, and I give her my card. I said, by the way, I'm a little Richard already. I'm Charles kind of Richard already drummer. She said, you can't be a little Richard already a drummer. I said, why? Here's the old, 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 she wants to say about four or five times, old, old, old man signed all the grass me when I was a young girl. I said, I'm the old man. We've been married 33 years, and they have a beautiful daughter, which is my personal marriage in public, Queen, Queen, we have a beautiful daughter named Queenie. We've been married 30, 33 years. It's a small world. Very small. And this world, like with the computer system and all that, the new uh, technique, the world is getting small and small. I didn't learn how to drive a car until I was uh, 47 years old because I didn't have to learn how to drive a car because I had my own band in Los Angeles called Left Set. I had to drive it to bring me everywhere and set up my drums and everything. But when we had Queenie, my wife, I bought my wife a car. When we had Queenie, my wife said, no, you're gonna have to learn how to drive a car. We have a baby now and you got to learn how to drive. I said, okay. And so she hired this driver instructor for, to teach me how to drive. Man, I was so damn scared, man. You ever been to Los Angeles on Hollywood and Holler? <laughs> Hollywood and Holler. Yep, Hollywood and Holler. You ever been there? Hollywood and Holler? And that's where the guy taught me how to drive. Man, I was so scared. I said, look, look, man, let's make a deal. You can have the check. And this tell my wife I can't learn how to, I don't know how to drive. <laughs> I don't know how to drive. And he said, we can't do that. Are oh, you jive, turkey, you mean you can't do that. But after three or four, I was supposed to take five lessons. After four or five, after the fifth lesson, man, I'm showing off. And you know, when you're driving, you got the drive instructor, he got his feet on the brakes too. I said, we ain't got to put on. Fat and fast, and I'm man, you go down here, I'm strong. I, I said, I could drive myself, but no, I got to, I, you know, and, and, and I took at about five, I full take five, I took full uh, tests and everything. They like driving, uh, and I passed. You know, you don't know what you can do until you try it. Like I said, what you got to fear? Huh? If you try to make up a pie and you're going to cross, so what? That's not the end of the world. If you hit on a chick, you hit on a young lady, and she say, uh, I don't want to be bothered with you, there's another one coming back, <laughs> right? I'm trying to be funny enough. But the thing about that is, you know, and then my daughter, Queenie, when I was, when I was in high school, freshman high school, we had typewriters, and I wasn't good at, at typing, you know. You know, one finger. My daughter and my wife taught me how to use a computer. Ten years ago, now I can send an email and stuff, man. Dad, <laughs> dude, I can send email, I can answer my email, go on the website. But I never thought I could do it with Dad, man. We didn't have no computers and stuff like that, you know? But you got to keep up with time. And you got to, uh, you got to surround yourself with people that know things that you don't know. That make you look good. Charles? Yes, sir. On that note about learning something that someone wanted you to hear the sound of those of the train of the wheels on the tracks. Yeah, well look Richard, uh, I would like to say I did it, I told him one time. Uh, little Richard, I was a star musician in Nashville, Tennessee. And Richard brought me back, me another guy back to uh 
Macon, Georgia, and he said that. I, I didn't think I was going to get that job with Richard because Richard, I was three behind my rent, had holes in my shoes, and my pants were two and everything, and my drum was in a pawn shop. And when he heard me play a drum, the, the drums belonged to the nightclub owner. You like the drum, the, the club had their own piano and they own a drum. And he said, I would like to take you back uh, to New Orleans. I mean, to Macon, Georgia. And that's when my heart dropped in my stomach. I said, man, I don't think you want to be bothered with me because I ain't got no drum to play on. I said, I got holes in my shoes behind them, my rip, and I ain't had a decent meal in, uh, in about, about, three, uh, about three weeks. I mean, bologna, sausage, pork and beans, and weenie. I still like pork and beans and weenie. But what happened? Uh, and, and he said, okay, baby, I'll take care of you everything. So we went back to me. He brought us back to Macon, Georgia. First time I was on a train, brought us to Macon, Georgia. The next day he came and picked me up at the hotel where we were staying at. And he told me, Charles, I want you to come to the train station with me on 5th Street up in Macon, Georgia. I said, now, what the hell do you want to bring me to the train station? I said, what about the other guy too? I want to bring you. Uh, All right. <laughs> so we went to the train station with Richard. And he said, the train pull off. He said, Charles, what kind of notes are those? I said, those are eight notes. And he said, that, uh, that's the kind of beat I want you to play behind me uh, when we had rehearsal of the afternoon. And uh, that's where I left up, eight notes. Eight notes at one end. I'm going to play it on a drum too with this. And the weird sound on drum there. Now, no drummers were playing that kind of beat before. All they were playing was the shuffle beat. Or they were playing the fast domino beat. I found my thrill. Or they were playing the swing beat. Uh, but even to the shuffle beat, I even, the shuffle beat later. But I put something extra to it uh, with my turn there. Make it more energized and stuff like that. And we, I created that beat up in Macon, Georgia, in night, I forgot what month, 1953. And a lot of drummers, a lot of drummers is playing that beat and they don't know where they originated from. I couldn't copyright, because you can't copyright a beat, but Richard gave me a thousand dollars for that idea. And that's why John Bottom, I think he was a kid at that time, John Bottom copied my style. And I said, John Bottom, John Bottom, a hell of a drummer. And I said, man, so Russ Pete. And I said that uh, John Bottom, he was more technical with it. I said, he didn't have enough red bean and rice and gumbo and okra <laughs> and watermelon to put in his beat. <laughs> so everybody thought it, but you know, he copied off me and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, Charles, could, yeah. uh, I'm gonna, uh, kind of continue our interview from before. I, could you describe for the audience uh, how exciting it was when you and Little Richard hit, first hit the road? What was that experience like when you first went out with Little, with Little Richard on the road? The first gig I played Richard on the road, it was exciting, man. I thought I went to heaven. And uh, playing with Little Richard, man, it was really in the whole world. And nobody, Richard, Richard wasn't all that popular. And, but one thing, Richard was playing for White and Black Club. But it was exciting to play with Richard. And uh, I mean, man, for the dress like that and everything, had your hair curled, <laughs> little rich. We wasn't gay, now Richard was on with gay, but we have to play that. I'd say that so sometimes I think I repeat myself, I guess I am. We have to dress that way for the play the white club so they think we would mess with the white girl. Lipstick and, uh, I mean, I lipstick a rug and pancake making and all that, and we have to switch and everything. And I asked little Richard Beautician one time, I say, I don't know, I don't really know how to act gay. I say, when you come to my hotel room tomorrow, I show me how to act gay with that hand thing. Because I didn't have it right, man. <laughs> I'm doing like, I'm doing, I'm doing like this and everything, like, you know. And he said, no, you gotta do it like that. You gotta be feminine, do it like that. You gotta do it like that, do it like that. So he finally taught me, you know. But that's when we be playing the club, going to the club, we have to act like that. Cause that's the only way, the strategy we used for the play the white club. And Richard Lyric wasn't 
funny. I mean, it wasn't like the hip hop uh, lyrics today. It was it was funny. I mean, see, uh, long tall. I would tell them, my man, long tall Sally was a real woman. Yeah, long tall Sally, and I mean bald head Sally. Sally was a real woman with a bald head, close head, and she only wear her wigs on the weekend. <laughs> uh, Uncle John, or well, Uncle John, that was Miss Ann. Miss Ann, he had a number called Miss Ann. Yeah, 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 Miss Ann. Dun, 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 dun. She do nothing, no one can. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, 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 Miss Ann. That was a white lady that owned a nightclub on Broadway, and she would let us go in the front door of the club, and we didn't have to go to the back door. That was thing. She loved him, but she died about five years ago, I think. You know? Oh yeah, another thing. The wop wop. I don't want to tell you the real lyrics to Tutti Fruity. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> uh, you want to hear the real lyrics to Tutti Fruity? Oh, yeah. Is it, is it okay, <laughs> Dennis? The real lyrics to Tutti Fruity. We couldn't record that. Yeah. The real lyrics to Tutti This is to an X-rated bookstore. Oh, okay. We all are devil sign. I'm the only one taking you though. But the thing about that, the real lyrics to uh, Tutti Fruity, and we, we couldn't record that. That's how Richard has to chant the lyrics to Tutti Fruity. You ready for this? Yeah. The real lyric for Tutti Fruity was, Tutti Fruity, good booty. <laughs> if it's tight, it's all right. Yeah. If it's greasy, it makes it so easy. Yeah. That's the real lyric. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real yeah, lyric to Tutti well, Fruity. Was, and we used to well, say it night, lover. There's wisdom. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the wah baba loo you know, wah baba loo bop, wah -ba Richard got that idea from me, from the drum. You know, uh, da, 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 da. the wop bop loop Wop bop loop bop, the wop bam boom bop. Bass drum wop and your kick drum. Now, it's a simple as that. Charles, uh, when the Rolling Stones followed James Brown, um, Mick Jagger learned a lot of things from James Brown, like doing the splits, but what I learned from your book was that when Little Richard was uh, for some, went to Hollywood for some kind of film shoot, James Brown filled in for him, and he, and he, he tried to look like Little Richard, and so we're, we're, we're try, I wanted to ask you what James Brown learned from Little Richard. Well, James Brown had never had a professional, I was the first professional drummer played by James Brown. And, uh, Jan Brown and Little Richard were booked by the same booking agent, Clint Bradley. And uh, Richard came out here on the West Coast for a screen test because they knew he was going to make a move. And Clint Bradley had already had 14 or 15 dates on Little Richard, but Clint Bradley didn't want to return the deposit back. So Jan Brown, Jan Brown uh, took Richard play, played those 14 or 15 dates on wow. Yeah. And now, you know, Jan Brown don't look nothing like Little Richard. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so they had the plaque card up there. And uh, the plaque card up there, and Richard picture. And they said, what well, we say, oh, here's come, cause it, it wasn't a communication like it is. Now, they the, the magazine and stuff, there wasn't no, 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 no TV and stuff like that. You can give away a lot of stuff. And we say, here come little Richard, little Richard. <laughs> you know, and Jan Brown came out there and everything, and he was so proud, proud to play with Richard's band and everything. Thank you know, for the play uh, but with us, you know, the band, so he felt good. Now, Richard, uh, uh, Jan Brown was a, was a hell of a, uh, a hell of a, uh, a dance. He could dance better than Richard. Jan, little Richard, you know the cape little Richard used to wear? Where you got that idea from? Liberace. You got it. <laughs> Liberace. With all those sparkling. I read your book. Uh, yeah, all the, <laughs> all those sparkles and everything up in his, uh, on the cape and everything. And, uh, and I think, I think, uh, Jan Brown got hit. I, I don't know if you guys know what uh, Jan Brown got his cape from. You know the raffler, the blonde raffler? You, you yeah. guys might be too Gorgeous George. Gorgeous George. Yeah. Gorgeous George. That's where Jan Brown got the cake and stuff from. Yeah. But everybody copied off each other and stuff like that, you know. But the place, I guess, I think it was the white apartment building 
and it turned into an African-American building. And so we, Jan Brown and, we, and me, we brought some girls up to, you know, they were next, I was next to, to Jan Brown. He said, man, watch me, I'm, I'm a Teddy's room. And I heard Jan Brown say, I feel good. <laughs> <coughs> and we used to get our hair curled and everything. Now, Jan Brown, we sit in the, in the beauty shop, and I got a cigar on my mouth, sure. I might look gay, but I ain't gay. And I have nothing against gay people because I I have this I have seen, I spent all my years experience. Some of the gay people are the most brilliant and the most creative people in the world. Let people be with them. If they're comfortable being there, I have nothing against that. You understand? Nothing against that. But Jan Brown, we be sitting up in the uh in the, uh in the beauty shop. And uh, I'll be with my leg crawl, and I got a cigar on my mouth, <laughs> and Jan Brown. And the people used to pay and say, what that men doing sitting up in the, uh, what that men doing sitting up in the, uh, in the beauty shop, getting your hair curl and everything. You know, but that was the thing. That's a weird tr track attention, and that was our gimmick. You have, like I say, you have to be, you want to be original, you want to be recognized, you have to do something different, you know. Of the venues that you've played, which ones do you like the best? Royal Theater in Baltimore, Maryland, also the Harvard Theater and and Warwick Theater, but the Harvard, the the um, the Apollo Theater. Now I played the uh, the Brooklyn Theater and Brooklyn. I like the Brooklyn Theater too, you know. I like, but all the places I like, I like playing New Orleans, I like play California, I like Sweden, Denmark. I like, we played the whole country of Australia, you know. I like Australia, I like Europe, you know. I never been to uh, Dominican Republic where my father from, I, maybe one of these days I'll go there, you know. But uh, I like to, I like big, big venture, big, big theaters and auditorium and things like that, you know. Now you know Buddy Holly, you ever heard of Buddy Holly? Oh, yeah. We played the uh, about 10 or 12 there, about 10 days, at the Brooklyn Paramount uh, with Buddy Holly. You ever heard of Larry Williams? I got a girl named Bonnie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that's Larry Williams. So we used to, um, at the, uh, I think we had two or three shows. We had about three shows there, two shows there, I don't remember. And at intermission, we used to go right across the street happy hour and they go drink, nothing heavy, drink beer and stuff, because we got to play the, the last show. So I was staying at the, Sir, I think it's Sir George or the St. George Hotel in Brooklyn. And one floor was for, you can, woman and man, one floor, woman and man. And then the other floor was for men, the only other floor for women, on weird. And so I was on the floor, you can bring anybody, you men and women. Say, Buddy Holly, say, hey, y'all, well, tell him, drink my beer, man, on the street. You don't know you're making history. You don't know you're making history. We know who made it in 1957. You know you're making history, man. He said, I know you got a, um, you sleep on a room, and you, you, you sleep on the floor, you can bring me out to you. He said, could I borrow your key? I said, okay, man, when we take another break, I'll, I'll lay you my key. Don't mess my bed up. You're going to bring a girl up there. <laughs> and so after the show, he, he returned my key, and I went back to my, my hotel room. I didn't, I didn't uh, see my bed messed up or nothing. I said, I don't know. If, he said he used the key, and I don't know if he did or not. He said he used the key. Now, I don't know, he shouldn't have had no action on my bed. He might have went to the bathroom floor, I don't know. But that's one of the stories about Buddy Holly. Great guy. Great guy, man, you know. Entertaining, you know. And those days you can play with black and white action those days. You know. Mm -hmm. Any to, other questions? Trying to remember the year that Buddy Holly appeared, but Buddy Holly appeared at the Apollo Theater as well. Yeah, yeah. But this is at the Brooklyn Paramount. At the Brooklyn, yeah. I'm Brooklyn Paramount, yeah, yeah, Brooklyn Paramount. And the real Mr. Rock and Roll, the, the real Mr. Rock and Roll, 
I know the Mr. Brown role like K Rod, but the real Alan Freed. Alan Freed, yeah. He was he was the he was the MC. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Good old days. Yeah. Good old good memories. You know what I mean? Question back there. Um, how was it playing with Professor Longhair and with Sam Cooke? Good question. Is that my daughter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> playing Professor Longhair was exciting because I had never played with a professional drummer like that. Uh, Professor, it was Mardi Gras Day, I think of 15, 16, it was Mardi Gras Day, and Professor, Drum, Professor Long had a, had a good drummer, but he kind of celebrated Mardi Gras Day a little too early. <laughs> I mean, he got drunk. And so they say, oh, well, Charlie, take private lesson. Uh, 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 let's see if Charlie, you know where he live in? He came and got me and everything. And said, I want you to play with Professor Longhead. Man, I was so damn scared. I thought shaking like that. Shaking. You have nothing to, like, uh, 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 went to the church and you have nothing to feel but fear. I was shaking like that, man. And I went and Professor had a big fat, Professor Longhead, he smoked a lot of pot and his eyes were glassy and he looked mean. But he wasn't a mean guy, a good guy. And so what happened? Uh, he said, you play drum. I heard you play drum. Yes, sir, I play drum, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Professor Longhead. He said, you don't have to call him Mr. Professor Longhead. Let's call him Professor I said, yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Professor Longhead. I was so damn nervous, man. I had my, I had my, my the drum stick on, on the drum. I was playing. I was shaking. Shaking, man. I said, I hope I don't have a heart attack. And we start playing, uh, well, I'm going to New Orleans. To uh, the middle of uh, when the middle of the song, when I'm going to all lean, I won't see the mind now. Professor looked back at me and he winked, and they say, Professor Longhead, wink at you. You consider the professional drummer, and he accept you. He accept you. And man, my confidence, my confidence, it's funny, man. How you confident? You get your confidence, you know. And he said, I want you to play other gigs with me. Now we played a place of, oh, my daughter quit. The, 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 the different plan behind, behind Fess Longhead and Sam Cooke. After we toured the whole country of Australia, Melbourne, Sydney, I love Australia. I have a son over there. And uh, what happened was, uh, well, the woman had a son for a minute. But uh, what happened was, uh, well, all the way, we left Hawaii and all the way to Wake Island and Fiji Island, it was a full engine plane. It wasn't no jet plane those days, full engine. And if one of the engines caught on fire, and Richard was talking about coming out of show business and everything like that. And so what happened, one of the engines caught on fire, and I, I think we had just left Fiji Island or Wake Island, one of those. We used to fuse up in the Wake and Fiji Island those days. And I, see, I said, I know the sun ain't shining, so the left engine, the engine was on fire. And Richard said, oh, the world is coming to an end. Man, I was so afraid and everything. I, I was drink. good thing I had a couple of drinks on me. You know, that's the funny thing. Uh, uh, when I was flying, I've been on a lot of planes, man. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, uh, 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 I, I didn't feel when I was drinking. I go on a damn plane now, you hear the tell I'm scared of hell, I don't drink no more. You know what I mean? But the thing about that, and that was the same time Russia had lunch Sputnik. You remember that? Or you read about that? Out of space. And you see the plane on fire. And uh, Russia launched Sputnik. And I'm gonna give I'm just gonna come out of show business. Cause this is the devil music. He thought called it devil music. So after we were in Australia for the second or third day, I mean after the last two days we played, we were going across a uh, um, a boat on a ferry, they had boats going on a ferry too. Richard said, I'm gonna throw all this jury in the river. I'm going to give my life to God and I'm going to be a seven day adventist. This is the dip belong to the devil. And here with my big mouth, I say, oh, Richard, I ain't thinking to be no preacher. Why don't you give it to me? No. <laughs> throw it, I know that, you know. He threw it all his jury overboard. You know? And uh, when he came back, he paid us all off for a couple of weeks or a month and a half and everything like that. And I say, man, what are we going to do now? We're not going to live this luxury life anymore. The drugs and the alcohol and the women and the hotel and the food and all that stuff. We're not going to live that kind. What are we going to do? So Richard paid us all. So this Sam guy, do you know there was a black guy, African-American guy, 
had, uh, that owned the Fillmore Auditorium. His name was Charles Sullivan. In the 50s, they found him dead. I think he was get too big for his britches or whatever. But the thing about that, so Charles Sullivan said, let me, let's keep the band together and I pay you guys so much a week for stay together. I said, man, there ain't nobody. Ain't anybody take a little Richard place? And then he said, about a month and a half later, he said that I got a, I got an author for you guys. And guess who the, guess who the singer was that take a little Richard place? It was on the same record label, a specialty record. Anyone in the audience tell who the guy was? Sam Cook. Sam Cook. <laughs> Sam Cook took little Richard, you know, and Sam Cook, and then D. Claw too, they tried to make uh, sing a, a little Richard out of D. Claw, but nobody could sing like Richard.